Kay, uh, this, welcome to the Tennessee Fish Wildlife Commission meeting. Uh, it's March 22nd. My name is Jeff McMillan. I'm chairman of, of the commission. And at this time, we're going to ask uh, Commission Cannon to do our invocation. Ms. Barbara, could you do us a roll call, please? Jim Bledsoe? Here. Harold Cannon? Here. Bill Cox? Here. Jeff Griggs? Here. Jeff McMillan? Here. Tom Rice? Here. Jim Ripley? Here. Julie Schuster? Here. Clayton Stout? Yes, ma'am. James Stroud? Here. Trey Teague? Here. Jamie Woodson? Thank you, Barbara. One of the privileges of being chairman in the first meeting is, is uh, I was involved or able to work with Ed and some of the commissioners to pick the um, chairmen of our committees, and I'm excited. I feel like our committee is going to be very strong this year, and, and uh, I just thought it'd be nice if uh, we would go through the committees, and I want to uh, introduce the uh, chairman and the vice chairman. Uh, our Wildlife Management Committee uh, is chaired by Commissioner Trey Teague, and our Vice Chairman is Commissioner Tom Rice. Our Fisheries Management Committee is uh, Chair, uh, Commissioner Jim Bledsoe is the chair, and our Vice Chairman is uh, Commissioner Bill Cox. Uh, our Boating and Law Enforcement Committee will be uh, chaired by Commissioner Harold Cannon, and the Vice will be Commissioner Jim Ripley. Our Budget Committee is going to be uh, chaired by Commissioner Jeff Griggs, and the vice chair will be uh, Commissioner Harold Cannon. We have a new uh, committee this year. It's uh, called Biodiversity Multiple Use. Uh, we've, uh, this is going to be uh, a committee that uh, a lot of our uh, WMAs and all are being approached by with different user groups, and we feel like we need to separate this co uh, committee out and uh, with the biodiversity of some of the other, other non-game uh, issues that we have, and we tried to group into that. And uh, Ms. Julie Schuster is going to be our chair, and Clayton Stout uh, will be the vice chair. Um, Government Relations Committee will naturally be headed up by Commissioner Jamie Woodson uh, with uh, Harold Cannon as the vice chair. Uh, our Retention Recruitment Committee uh, will be chaired by Julie Schuster, and our vice chair will be uh, Commissioner James Stroud. And lot and the last, uh, we have our audit committee chairman is Bill Cox with the vice chair, Jeff Grigg. So I'm excited about these committees. I think we have a, I think the addition of some additional commissioners has made it easier to uh, spread out the uh, responsibilities. And I'm excited that our committees are going to be strong. And I think we're going to have an excellent year. So, um, you know, today is a one-day meeting in which we have combined the, the committee and, um, and our official meeting. Uh, each committee chairman, I'm going to get y'all to conduct your uh, uh, businesses as, as though it's a Thursday meeting, but when it comes to a roll call, uh, I will handle the, uh, I'm not a roll call, excuse me, uh, for motions, I will handle the motions and, and the vote, okay? So that way we can combine it in that, in that regard. Uh, uh, at this time, I would like to ask for a motion for approval of the February meeting minutes. Second. So we have a first and a second. 
Right, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Right, so approved. Okay. Uh, before we go into the, our committees, are there any announcements that uh, Mr. Director Carter that you would have or any, anything from the commission? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to. We have a young lady in the audience today. Me being a West Tennessee man, I've gotten to recognize her. Alan Peterson is our Region 1 manager, and his daughter, Christy Peterson, with Parks and Greenways here today. Christy, would you stand? I know your face is red. <laughs> Please stand. Thank you. <laughs> I know in the past, and it might be a request, and if you don't want to do it, that's fine, but I know we have people here today like Mr. Crabtree and Mr. Fine, but i like for the people that's here representing somebody, if they would just stand and say their name, who they're with. That'd be great. <laughs> Ron Crabtree, Quail Forever. I know Steve Walsh, you're in the crowd. Steve Walsh, Tennessee Parks and Greenways Foundation. Well, I would like to request all the visitors sign the sign-in sheet uh, that's being passed around. I assume it's going around now. And if you'd like to address the commission, you're so welcome to, but please hold your hand up for, for, for permission to speak during the appropriate committee meeting that's, uh, that we're pertaining to. and. Uh, if you would introduce yourself and come to the mic and introduce yourself and direct your questions to, to the commission. Um, um, I do reserve the right, though, if things become repetitive, that we can limit the conversation if it gets repetitive. So, But uh, we appreciate all the visitors and all the interest in who's here. And uh, at this time, then we'll uh, turn, a, turn our meeting over to our fish, I mean, our wildlife chairman, uh, Commissioner T. Thank you. Trey Teague, Chair of the Wildlife Management Committee. I'd like to recognize Joey Woodard to give us uh, some information on the governor's one-shot turkey hunt. Thank you, Commissioner Teague. Uh, thank you to the commission for allowing me this opportunity to present on the governor's one-shot turkey hunt. Uh, for those of you that may not be familiar, uh, I'm with the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Foundation, and uh, the uh, Governor's One Shot Turkey Hunt is our flagship fundraising event that we have each year. Uh, it's always the second weekend of turkey season, and historically the event had been held in uh, Giles County in Pulaski, Tennessee. Last year we made a move and brought it to Nashville. Uh, last year's event was held at the Loveless Cafe, and in an effort to grow the event, and we've once again changed the venue, and I think we found a place where we want to stay now. This year it'll be at the Ag Expo Center, off of uh, I-65 South, just south of Nashville. And I believe there's a short video uh, that uh, we'll play really <coughs> quickly here. I can find the right one. Hi folks, I'm Daryl Singletary here with a special invitation. Join us at the Williamson County Ag Expo on Friday, April the 5th for a country music concert featuring Gary Morris and myself. This event is a fundraiser for wildlife through the Tennessee Wildlife Resource Foundation Governor's One Shot Turkey Hunt. Tickets are just $25 and are available at the door or online at twrf.net. April the 5th, 7 p.m., Williamson County Ag Expo. We'll see you there. Again, I'd like to give a special thanks to Don King uh, for helping us put that uh, little uh, production together. Uh, tell you a little bit more about the event. One of the reasons that we changed the venue was to allow for the concert on Friday night. That's something a little bit different. Uh, we've always had music as a component of our event, but typically that was on Saturday night at the banquet this year. We're going to have the concert. Uh, Daryl Singletary and Gary Morris are going to headline uh, at the Ag Expo Center on Friday night. Uh, another thing that's changed a little bit with the event this year, uh, it's going to be a two-day hunt. Uh, in years past, it's been a, a one-day hunt, and uh, we asked a lot of our hunters and participants last year, you know, what could we do to make the event better, and a lot of them expressed an interest in, in, in having a, an extended opportunity to hunt. Um, helps with weather and, and uncooperative birds. Uh, so now people are going to have two days that they can hunt. Um, the hunt is a, a friendly competition, if you will. We will measure, weigh the birds, and there is an overall winner. Uh, there's prizes for that, but more than anything, it's, it's bragging rights. Um, the events, the planning of the events going really well this year. We've got uh, approximately 50 uh, hunters that are going to uh, hunt in the event this year. Uh, in addition to that, I think we're going to have maybe 20 wounded warriors that will participate, so a total of 70 hunters taking the field on, on sa uh, Friday and Saturday. Uh, we've got a lot of great auction items. Some of you may have been getting the emails of our auction items. We're really excited about that. Some just fabulous hunts uh, all over the world. Uh, we're hopeful to have a, a big crowd there. We're expecting somewhere between four and 500 people uh, at the event. 
And um, this being the first year that we're at the Ag Expo Center, it's going to be a little different for us, but we're really excited about that venue because it's so large. It's going to allow us to expand this event. You know, our goal would be to have a, a, the concert become a big part of this event uh, and, and bring more of the, the general public into, into the event. Um, it's also my understanding that the commission uh, has, uh, has uh, supported this event and is willing to sponsor some wounded warriors, so I'd like to thank the commission for their support of this event. We will have a table uh, there Saturday night reserved for, for the commissioners that can attend. Uh, if there are any questions about the event or if you need more information, please don't hesitate to give me a call. I'd be happy to uh, fill you in, and we're hoping that uh, everybody will come out and have a good time. Thank you. Thank you. Joey, uh, if you would just stay up there, please. Um, we have a we the commission as a whole has decided that we do want to support the Wounded Warriors. I wasn't wasn't aware that you were already um, aware of it, but we uh, have. Um, taking up donations and we want to try to support three. So we've got a check that Trey and I want to present to you for $3,000 from the commission. Thank you very much. <laughs> it depends on how much you write the check for. But, uh, I, Joey, I'm disappointed I'm not going to get to go this year. My son planned a wedding during turkey season, which I've chastised him for quite a bit for doing that. So he wasn't thinking he was at a weak moment, I guess. But it would be the first time that uh, I've not been able to go since I've been on the commission. And it's an excellent event. And I think what y'all do for the – for the, re for the agency itself is awesome, and, and uh, I I'm excited to see that you moved it to two days because last year was the first day that I didn't get a bird that, since I've been hunting. But uh, I'll say this, the first year was exciting for me because when I came in with my bird, the only comment I had was uh, I wanted to be bigger than Julie Schuster's, and she was had the lead at, the point, at, that, <laughs> at that point, and I think they stretched the hair on that beard pretty good because I beat her, for, I think, by one point or something. So... <laughs> It was pretty awesome. I, I just wanted to bring it up and rub it in one more time. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks, Mr. Jeff. You know, we were talking about the, um, the event now being moved uh, to the Ag Center down there, and we've been talking quite, about, uh, quite a bit about these concerts. And that, just an explanation real quick, we, we actually had a, a, a lot more artists this year the, initially uh, for the concert but we found out that it coincides, or it's the same night as the Academy of Country Awards, which is in uh, Las Vegas. So we lost a lot of our artists. So what we need to do is find out early enough next year when those dates are and see if we can't make some sense out of it. So because we had a lot of, of, of uh, support from the music community about this, and a lot of our you know artists are, are hunters, and they were in, and then we, we sort of lost them so i believe next year and you're talking about growing the venue and growing this event it'll be much much bigger next year i hope so each year we we uh, tend to try to try to struggle with easter staying up with easter meal day and, and uh weddings it seems to be there's a lot of weddings <laughs> i hope i just have one wedding so <laughs> but thank you very much sir. thank you mr draft next i'd like to introduce scott summers State ornithologist to talk to us about the Golden Eagle Project. Good morning, Commission. Um, glad to have the opportunity to, to brief you on a project on wintering golden eagles that the agency has been working on for a couple of years. Um, so we get this to work here. Just a very brief background on golden eagles, typically pretty rare in the east in winter, or so we thought. 
there's really two populations. Um, I don't have a, a laser pointer here, but um, you can see my cursor. There's really two populations. The majority of them are out west. When you think of golden eagles, you think of open plains. But there's a small breeding population in the east of about one to 3,000 birds. And they breed in Labrador, Quebec, and Ontario. And then in winter, they come down through the Great Lakes and down the Appalachian Mountains. And so these are probably birds that are, are seen in Tennessee periodically. Um, as far as Tennessee birds, they're here primarily from September through April. And we don't really know much about them. They're here and there, um, not seen all that often, but they're typically a forest bird, which is the exact opposite of what you get out west. So the project that the agency has been involved with is a very large project to survey for golden eagles across the winter range, um, coordinating with the Eastern Golden Eagle Working Group through Todd Katzner at West Virginia University. Now the main goal of this project is to understand the population size, habitat use, spatial movements of these birds, what they're doing basically, um, migratory corridors, particularly in areas where wind development has um, a great potential. So you ask how you catch golden eagles and, and find them, roadkill deer carcasses and trail cams. So you find a small clearing in the woods. Uh, this is Sterling Daniels up in Region 4 driving rebar through a deer carcass. Otherwise, the coyotes drag it off as soon as they find it. Uh, and golden eagles are scavengers. And you put out, golden eagles will show up very quickly on these sites. So to put the perspective of the project, um, all these little markers are different bait sites that have been surveyed. And this was last winter. So there are about 150 in winter 2011, 2012. So there's more sites this year. There are about 200 sites this year, all across the entire winter range of the species. So we're big perspective here on, on goldens, and we're getting lots of information across the whole range, not just on goldens, but all the other critters that are coming to these bait sites. It's actually pretty neat stuff. So here's a, a map of just a few sites that we surveyed in 2011, just in Walden up in Region 4, put this together. Um, we had survey sites basically in the Appalachian Mountain part of the state. So these red dots down here are sites in Region 3. Region 4 man managed sites all across the region, all the corners of Region 4. And Nature Conservancy ran three bait sites up in Shady Valley. As it turns out, I was very wrong in not thinking, well, we don't really have very many goldens. We actually found them at six different places. All corners of um, the survey areas, we actually had two birds on a site down here in uh, Monroe County. So here's just a couple pictures. This was a bird of North Cumberland WMA that showed up two hours after Sterling put out the deer carcass. I don't know how the golden eagle just happened to stop by and was flying around and found it, and it was there off and on for um, about 10 days. This bird was a one-day wonder up at Roan Mountain. And this was at Beaver Dam Bald in uh, South Cherokee National Forest in Monroe County. We actually had two birds at the same time. That was pretty exciting stuff. So in 2013, we decided to not just run some more bait sites to see if we can find goldens in different places. Um, we expanded over to, to Region 2 down here, Bear Hollow Mountain in Franklin County. Josh Campbell and Terry Hopkins ran some sites down there. But we also worked with cellular tracking technologies, which makes transmitters that dump to cell towers. And we wanted to try to catch some birds. And it turns out we caught three golden eagles. Uh, I was hoping for four, but three is better than none. So you, you basically catch golden eagles using a small net gun, very similar to uh, duck and turkey trapping. Um, this is actually only 20 foot by 20 foot. It's very small. Um, the padded um, training bumpers for dogs are used for the projectiles. Uh, it, it can be uh, launched with a remote, control, remote control car controller from up to a couple hundred yards away. So that golden eagle comes down. If it's standing right on the deer carcass and they set it up, that shoots right on top of the golden eagle. And when you get one in hand, they are massive birds. They take all kinds of measurements. They take blood samples, look at genetic work. Um, it takes an hour, hour and a half to process a bird. And then they also attract, attach the transmitters. So these are solar powered, so they can last for several years. They're recording data every 15 minutes, so we're getting a GPS point continuously. And that can actually be reprogrammed. So as soon as it pings the cell tower, you can reprogram it to record data every 30 seconds if you want. So when that bird's making a fast migration, we can know exactly where that bird is almost at all times. 
And so this, although the bird can be out of range of a cell tower, and we don't get data for a few days or a couple months if it's up in northern Canada, it stores over 100,000 points, so we can get tons and tons of data. And this is significantly cheaper than um, satellite transmitters because you have that satellite time. And that gets pretty pricey. So there's that caveat of you're saving a lot of money on the front end, but um, you don't always get data every single day or every couple of days. So here's a picture of a bird with the transmitter on the back. It only weighs about 2% of the bird's total body weight, so they've had these transmitters on birds for five or six years. This was a, a bird up on Unica Mountain. It's about a 10-year-old bird. Here's a picture of uh, Keith Thomas from North Cumberland. He's a, um, he works up on the Sunquist unit with a three-year-old golden eagle that we caught. And this is a, a very small male. A female would be probably 60% larger. Really big birds. So this is an example of some of the data that we're getting off of these birds. Um, basically, the data gets sent to a cell tower. We can look at it online, open it up on Google Earth, and see the track of this bird and see what these birds are doing exactly where they're going. So this bird um, was caught down near uh, Bear Hollow Mountain in Franklin County, shot up through Tennessee, went all the way up to southern Michigan over about the 10-day period. And this is a five-year-old bird. He's probably going to try to breed this year. Got up to southern Michigan, big snowstorm, turned around, came all the way back south and has done this big loop through Indiana and Illinois. And actually, Wednesday morning, the bird was down here in southern Indiana. And then by yesterday morning, when I looked at the data, it was all the way back up here near South Bend. So it must have decided, it is time. I've got to get a territory. I've got to go. So this is, the, this is, this is some really neat stuff that we're getting. And so we have three birds tracked, but they've got 60, 70 birds have been tracked over the last five years. So we're getting data across the entire um, eastern United States. So we're learning about the movements of these birds, the habitat use. They're spending all their time in the forest. If you really zoom in up here, you can't really see this here, but there's a narrow forested corridor, a riverine bottom here, and it's actually very narrow here. And that bird is spending all of its time right over it or right in it. They're sitting in the woods. Don't know what they're doing, but they're sitting in the woods. So some of the future work that we're going to do, we've, we've captured thousands and thousands of images of goldens. We're going to go through them all and see how many different individuals have been coming to sites. We know we had at least three different birds on bait sites at Bear Hollow Mountain. You just see one at a time, but they're different birds, <laughs> which is really interesting once you start looking at them. And uh, ideally, we can try to catch a few more birds and get some transmitters on some more birds next year. So I've got a little video. Let me get this to work. All right, it's on. Okay, hold on a minute. Okay. Oh. This is, this is Keith up at uh, North Cumberland getting to let the bird go. It's a big bird. <coughs> and that bird, this particular bird has wandered in the Cumberland Mountains up into Kentucky, back on the North Cumberland about three times, and he's wandering around a lot more than young birds often do. But he's trying to figure out how to survive. Any questions? I have one. Yeah. How do you attach the device and it's get a, it to it's stay? It's a big leather harness that wraps around the bird. You ever lost one? Um, I don't know if they've ever lost one. They're, it's a harness. They're pretty secure, yeah. yeah. 15, 20 years in the wild. Um, well, that. Thank you. Next, Chuck Yost is going to talk to us about landowner exemption program. Good morning, commissioners. For, the, for those of you who aren't familiar with, with what I do, I'm the wild hog coordinator for TWRA. And last, last night I was talking to my wife about this presentation and, 
I said, you know, I always like to start off with something that kind of gets me to settle in to my talk. And I said, well, I've, I've got a joke. Do you think I ought to share it? And she said, well, I don't know. She said, you better let me hear it in case it's a bad joke. So I said, well, what is the, or who is the smartest pig that, that ever lived? And she said, well, I don't know. And I said, well, it's Ein's wine. And she said, no, don't you dare tell that joke. <laughs> so, so I'm not going to share that joke with you. <laughs> but, uh, but I am going to share with you the results of the 2012 wild hog exemptions. And just to review you on what a wild hog exemption is, is uh, landowners can now call a regional office any time of the year and uh, it enables them to uh, conduct control methods on their properties for wild hogs that used to require a depredation permit. So in the, pa in the past, previous to 2011, if landowners had wild hog problems, uh, they had to contact a regional office, a wildlife officer had to come out and uh, do a site visit and then issue a depredation permit. Well, that's a thing of the past now, and things are much more convenient. And the landowners just simply call. They're issued an exemption over the phone, and it enables, enables them to do things, for example, uh, hunt at night or, or trap year-round. So that's, that's what the exemption program is. In 2012, uh, there were 1,114 exemptions issued to landowners. And by comparison, that's a 41% increase from 2011, which that's, that's a rather significant increase. Uh, but I, th I think the, the reason for that jump is that 2012 is our first full year of exemptions. The first year that we issued them was 2011, uh, but we didn't start until April, so it was an abbreviated year. Therefore, uh, this is our first full year. And then also, I think the, uh, the interest in our program is, is growing. So I think that's, that's why you see that jump of 41%. And keep in mind that uh, I said there were 1,114 exemptions. That's not 1,114 landowners, because some landowners have multiple exemptions because they get an exemption for each of their properties. So just, just so you know that. Now, if you look at these exemptions for 2012 by region, these are your totals. And you'll notice that region three is where the most of the exemptions are. So you may be interested in seeing how this affects the area that you represent, and that's, that's that information. Yes, sir. And the, the interesting thing about these numbers are is that this is consistent with where you see the, the majority of pigs or wild hogs. So most of you know that you're going to find the majority of, of wild hogs in Tennessee in, in Region 3. So that's why you see that. Now, one, one condition of an exemption is that they, they expire at the end of the year and landowners are required to submit a report um, of, of what they killed and how they killed it. And this is really valuable information for us. It allows us to evaluate this program over time to see just how effective it is uh, as a control program. And before I dive into the results of the reports for this year, I'd, I'd like, to, like to real quickly say thank you to, to Gray Anderson and Joy Sweeney for helping me compile these reports and uh, have this information available for today. So thank you guys for that. Now, for this year, we had a 62% response rate on these landowner reports. And th that 62% of exemption holders um, they reported 2,753 wild hogs. Now, if you, look, if you consider that number and consider that that was 62% of, um, of the exemption holders, with a little math, you can, you can, we were able to come up with a good estimate of 3,800 hogs killed by 
exemption holders in 2012. So, it's, so our number is approximately 3,800 hogs, which is about a 600 hog increase from the first year. So not only are the number of exemptions going up, but the number of wild hogs that they're, they're taking is going up, which is good. And if you look at how these, um, how these wild hogs were taken, this is, this is how, it, how it looks for 2012. You had 38% were taken by trapping, 38 by shooting, 18 by other methods. And other methods would include, in, include the use of dogs in the four county experimental area. And uh, then you had 6% that were unknown. And the reason that unknown category is there is because some of these reports, they just turned in a number. Uh, they didn't say how those hogs were taken. So that, that's, that's real interesting because if you look at 2011, uh, quite a bit more hogs were trapped this year than last year. And uh, that's, that's good. That's a good thing. And, and I, the, I, I believe the reasons for that are that one, landowners are getting more efficient or they're getting better at trapping, so they're catching more hogs, obviously. And two, the word's getting out that trapping is the best control method for wild hogs. So I think they're catching on, so that's, that's good. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. I, I should have pointed that out, but all of this data, it, these, this does not include any wild hogs that the wildlife agency has trapped. Okay, or 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 kill. This is simply private landowners, and that's that's the that's what this program is intended for: is the private landowner to protect their property. Now, as of now for 2013, there are 785 exemptions, and that's already more than the first year. The first year was 760, but that's where we stand as of now, and they're issued throughout the year, so that number will continue to go to go up throughout the year. Now, just to, just to, this was a, a personal interest of mine was we don't ask for comments on this report. However, we do receive some comments. And I had about 700 reports and I just thought it'd be interesting to flip through them and see what kind of comments are there. And it was real interesting and one of the, one of the most profound things that I found was that there were zero negative comments about this program. There were two negative comments, but they weren't directed at the program. They just simply were like this example. It says, I can't find <laughs> anyone that will hunt after I put their names on the list. And that, that makes sense to me because this is hard work. And whenever, whenever you set out to control wild pigs, it takes a lot of work and the people that are in it for fun lose interest very quickly. So that just further proves that. But, the only two negative comments related to something like this, it wasn't towards the, the program. <laughs> On the other hand, some positive things, I, I, I've just got a few examples I wanted to show you. If you look at that bottom line there, it's talking about how this is a very useful program. And I, I think that's wonderful. And <coughs> this, this, is, this is kind of rough here, so I'll read through it. But it says, no, no hog spotted or killed on property. 2012 tried baiting, but no results. It says, not as much hog sign as there was, or had, or excuse me, I'll start over. Not as much hog sign as there has been in the last five years. So that's that's really that's really positive, and it's good to see those results. This one this one's even better. It says big reduction in field damage this year as few hogs remain. Border Katusa and few hogs come in from there. Not the 30 or 40 we saw in previous years. So just further proof that this is working out well and some proof that the, the work that our guys are doing in the field with trapping, this is, this is proof that that's going really well. It says game warden trapped around 40 hogs in a field near mine, thanks for your help. So this is just a really good program. This is a wonderful program, definitely glad to report no 2012 problems, keep up the good work. So as you can see, this program is an absolute success. <laughs> So things are just going very well, and it's a good program, and that's all I've got. I think you need to work on your vertical leap, though. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for me? 
Let's talk about West Tennessee real quick. Uh, I noticed you had 60. What areas are you seeing them in? I've heard there's some up on the refuge in Henry County. I've heard some in Hardin. Where, where are you seeing the hogs in West Tennessee? I hear McNary County a lot. That's close I know to they've got a well-established population in McNary, Hardin. Are there any region, region one personnel here that Tipton County? Yeah. <coughs> West Tennessee is interesting because other than just a county or two, they're real small pockets. And that's, uh, that. you can look at that as a good thing because there's a possibility of eliminating those pockets and that should be our priority over time. So uh, that's, that's how I would describe uh, West Tennessee is just real spotty, except for maybe one or two counties. Do you think they were transported in or no way of knowing? Well, yeah. they. They didn't occur there naturally, so yes, they were put there. Okay. Let's keep them out of West and see if we can. Amen. Can, can hang on just for a minute. Let's have yes, a pause sir. so they can get our video straight, please. 